from heaven and given the mystery, the revelation of the gospel of Christ. I mean, unless unless you really hold that that truth, you you get all messed up. Sorry, I'm on a little rant. Anyway, no, you're right. Okay. Yeah, it must be from the conference. <laughs> it, yeah, I think I, th I think one of the big hurdles for people is they approach their relationship with God much like they re uh, approach a an occupation that they would do. So, like when I wanted to become an accountant, um, I had to go to school. I had to take certain courses. I had textbooks, and I read the textbooks. But if the professor said something different from the textbook. Well, I chose the professor over the textbook because he's the one who's going to be grading my paper, so I wanted to get you know good grades, so I'm going to go by whatever the professor says. So I, so I got my textbook, and they say, this is your authority, you know, principles of accounting, let's say. But I'm really, my authority in that class is really the professor. Uh, and I think a lot of times, churchianity, it's been built as a system that is a man-made system, and it's sort of like a college. So I figure, well, if I'm going to understand you know, what God's Word said, what the Gospel is, or what the Book of Acts is talking about versus Romans, or I'm just going to go by what the pastor says in my church because he's the authority. He knows more than I do. I've got the Bible, and I'll read it, but I'm going to filter it and make sure it matches whatever that pastor says. And if I see something that I question that's a little different from what he says, I'll go to the pastor and then he'll set me on the right track of what it says. And that's the, I think that's the big hurdle because when it comes to the Bible, it's completely different. We've got, first off, the Bible is truth. There's, God does not lie. So the, the Bible needs to be the authority over the pastor. And because we know the Bible, if, if the pastor says something different from the Bible, we, all, we know the Bible is always right. The one who's going to judge me is God. In the college class, it's the professor. But when it comes to God's word, it's God who's going to judge me. So I've got to. So I got to make the Bible my authority there. And and the big difference is because in a in a college, like if I'm taking like I took a statistics class, and so then they talk about you know standard deviations and the mean and all these you know, different things, delta, and you use these formulas. I don't know this stuff. The guy who's talking up there knows it. So I'm going to listen to what the professor says so I can do my statistic classes, homework. And that's what people think with the Bible. They're like, Greek, Hebrew, I, I don't know this stuff. This guy, the pastor knows this better, so I'll just take his word for it. But the difference is, we've got the Holy Ghost given unto us, and the Holy Ghost is our teacher. Not the pastor, but the, but the Holy Ghost. So we've got a, a Bible that is God's truth without error. No lie, so I can always believe Scripture. It's always, always, always true. And so I've got the perfect text, the Bible, and I've got the perfect teacher, the Holy Ghost, with me as I read the Bible. So that's the system that I need to tap into. God's Word is my authority, and the Holy Ghost teaching it to me as I read it. The pastor may or may not be right. I mean, it's good to listen to messages and you learn things from them. But like we told Laura, you know, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. So our system here is a little different. When I've got the, when I'm taking a class, in the statistics, statistics class, I've got the book that the guy wrote, but he's a man, so there's going to be some error in it. And then I've got... Uh, so I've got his book with errors in it, and I don't have him there in person teaching the class. So I've got to have the professor who's teaching for him. So that's why I listen to the professor over the book, so the professor can correct any errors that are in the book. But when it comes to God, God wrote the book, it's perfect. There are no errors in it. So I, so I don't ever need to doubt God's Word. I can always trust it. And then I've got the perfect teacher, the one who wrote the book, God himself, dwelling within me, teaching me God's word as I read it. 
And so God did that so that now we can understand the things of God. We've got God controlling the whole system. And so all I have to do is let it happen. Paul wrote, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's interesting. You know, that's more of a, a passive thing. It's not me. I got to go out there and work really hard and make sure. No, he said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's a more passive thing because God's word is perfect and God is, is perfect in teaching me his word because God is within me to teach me his word. So all I have to do is get my selfishness and my pride and my religious ideas aside. Paul says, casting down every imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. So all I do is basically get out of the way of God's perfect word and God within me teaching it to me, and I just let it dwell within me. And that's the difficult thing because it goes against our pride and our human nature, because our sin nature is we're trying to get the flesh lusteth against the spirit. So I don't want to let the word of God dwell in me. My flesh wants to take the active approach. And so then that's where you get churchianity and those systems built up. And that's contrary to how the world works. Now, if I want to be an accountant, I can get an accounting book and read it and learn it myself, but I'm probably not going to understand everything because I don't have a teacher there. There could be things wrong in it. And even if I did understand it, I can't really get a job in accounting because they're going to want that degree. They're going to want that piece of paper. So the world has conditioned me to not trust the book that I have and have a professor tell me what the book says or what, it, what the real thing is. And I have to get out of that mindset when it comes to the Word of God and say, no, the book is correct. There are no errors in the Bible. And the teacher isn't the pastor. The teacher is God himself, the Holy Ghost within me. And so I'm going to have the Bible as my authority and the Holy Ghost teaching it to me. And if man teaches me something good, that's great. But if it's contrary to what God's Word is, I'm going to reject that. So we have to get out of the mindset of what man's system is and how the material world works and get onto the mindset of how the spiritual world works. <laughs> you may want to edit this later, but anyway, um, yeah, yeah, but then, you know, we come along, like Tom and I, you know, we come along and, you know, we hear somebody like yourself, and we're attracted to that, and what you're saying, and it resonates with us. Now, I can't speak for Tom, but, I mean, I don't, I I need, I don't know why, but I mean, like you still rely on brethren like yourself who have kind of gone before and kind of blazed the trail. And, you know, it's like, kind of like walking through a jungle and you, like, here's this little path of right dividing teachers who have gone before us. And we kind of, you know, listen and ask questions of you. And I know what's with this cat today. It's like, man, uh, <laughs> she always sleeps in the day. I don't know what the deal is. She uh, wants some love. You know, so <laughs> is there is there something like it's not wrong for us to come and listen to you and and uh, you know ask questions and help us to understand it. This is the part I, I have trouble with. Like, okay, so the Holy Spirit is yeah. in us, but why, like, Acts 4.12, like, I've read that my whole life. I've preached from that verse, you know? And now you, in, you know, three minutes, just blow that verse out of the water for me, <laughs> which is good, in a good way. I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way. Right. And now I, I understand. It's the name, right? And it's looking forward because they were going to go under the tribulation. Like, it all fits in together. So so why, like, I'm 60? Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I have to... It took me this long to figure that verse out, and I, 
a dear brother has to show it to me, you know? So that's what, that I guess I kind of, I mean, I was searching, you know what I mean, all those years for the answers to the contradictions and that, you know? And I guess, you know, it, it just, it came about that I, I came upon right division, right? But it was because somebody, I heard somebody, you know? And then somebody like yourself who opens up their their home and their time to teach us more of it, uh, it we gravitate to that because it resonates with, is it that it's resonating with the Holy Spirit that dwells within me? Right. And that it, it's, you know, I mean, like you, you are an intelligent guy. Like, I mean, I could not do accounting for the life of me. I can hardly, when I had my business, I could hardly do the books. <laughs> money in, money out. Like, you know, how easy can it be, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, so is there a level of intelligence that uh, also helps you study the Bible? You know, like we were talking about gift versus ability and all that stuff. Uh, Sorry, I'm rambling. But, you know. No, it's, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with listening to preachers. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. Now I'll read a few verses here. 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So, um... You know, the gospel is written down, at least today. I mean, right then it wasn't because, you know, it was a new dispensation. But um, today, the gospel is written down. It's in God's word. So, you know, theoretically, you wouldn't really need any. If, it, if God's word is complete and it's true, theoretically, I don't need anybody to, I don't have to listen to anybody. I can just read God's word. Uh, the gospel today, though, is in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. How am I going to find that? Now, if I'm on some deserted island or there's somebody, there's no one around who teaches that gospel and I'm diligently seeking for it, um, you know, maybe I could find it. But um, finding the understanding of something is uh, a lot of times, you know, maybe you wouldn't find it. And so that's why he sends preachers. I think of over in Acts chapter 8, you've got Philip and you've got the, the eunuch who came to Jerusalem. He heard that Jesus had been crucified Apparently, he was trying to relate it to Isaiah 53, which he was led as a sheep before uh, his shearers, as dumb as a sheep before his shearers, so he opened out his mouth. And he was uh, cut off by, by them there. He was reading Isaiah 53. That was the correct passage to read in your Old Testament about Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus' crucifixion had just happened. Philip, uh, probably a year beforehand, Philip is trying to understand it, and apparently he's a Bible believer because he's gone to Isaiah 53, and he's found the right passage that says that is the prophecy of Jesus being crucified. But yet Philip asks him and says, Understandest what thou readest? And he says, How can I unless someone teach it to me? It's like he's got God's word. It's there. The Holy Ghost must have led him to that verse. I mean, the Old Testament's pretty big. You know, how did he, how was it? It's not a coincidence that Philip had read Isaiah 53 just after Jesus fulfilled Isaiah 53. It's no coincidence. But yet he wasn't able to put the two together. Um, did I say Philip? I meant the eunuch. The eunuch, oh, you know what I meant. The eunuch was trying to, Read Isaiah 53. He knows that he he knows that Jesus was just crucified. He just read the passage of Isaiah 53, and yet he's still not able to put the two together. Right. So then he yeah. says, "Well, how can I understand unless somebody teach me?" So then Philip shows the eunuch that, and it's like as clear as day. He says, "Oh, I never. Why couldn't I see that? You're right. That's just what happened." Yeah. And yeah. it's it's because a lot of times. God uses people who have already learned those things to help others. And that's basically what Paul is saying here. 1 Corinthians 1.17 Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel, 
not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the... And here's the verse I wanted to key on, verse 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So the world has the Bible... The problem is they don't, they don't learn the wisdom of God because they approach it from their fleshly standpoint. And so then it takes the foolishness of preaching to basically put two and two together so that you understand the gospel. Uh, so that's why, and that's with the gospel, but then it applies for sound doctrine as well. Uh, I grew up in a church that did not teach the mystery, did not teach right division. One of their theme verses was 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When I went to Calvary Chapel Bible College, that was their theme verse. If you saw their letterhead, the letterhead said 2 Timothy 2.15. I had a sweatshirt. It's too small for me now. I don't know if I still have it. I had a sweatshirt with the emblem of the college on the front, and on the back was the text of 2 Timothy 2.15 in a King James Bible. That was their letterhead. That was their mission, was to rightly divide the word of truth. But they didn't rightly divide the word of truth because they were caught in their religion. And so to me, when I was a kid, I read Paul's epistles. Um, I believed it was the word of God, but I never saw the mystery. Because it was like my mind was just, it was just, it's like it's oriented toward unbelief. You've got that sin nature and you don't realize it, but he, I mean, you're genuinely trying to believe God's word. Why else are you reading it? You're reading it, trying to understand it. I'm not trying to get a degree from a seminary school. I wasn't trying to become a pastor. I wasn't making an occupation or a living out of it. I'm reading it so I can understand it and have God work through me. And I read Romans through Philemon, and I don't see the mystery. But yet, when I'm 18, then somebody comes along from that, that right division church. He wasn't the pastor. He was a, a deacon in the church. Um, he doesn't have a degree or anything. And he simply opens up Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 and shows me that I cannot lose my salvation. And then I give the argument. He says, well, no, look at the verse. And it's just so simple. It's just yeah. simple words that I had read, I had it memorized. I had those two verses memorized. I read them many times. But I didn't yeah. understand that my salvation was eternally secure until that guy from that church came and showed it to me. And so I think that's really the summary of how a lot of times, and that's why you do need to listen to other people, because it says there, and it's not that I'm more important than anybody else or somebody else, that's not the issue. It's just God says there, after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. God wants to, and he says, you know, verse 27, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. So the way God gets you to learn sound doctrine a lot of times is by somebody who just preaches it, who doesn't have, who's completely removed from the world system, who doesn't have a seminary degree, who's not representing a denomination. It's just a Bible believer who loved the Lord enough to read it and believe it and have other people teach it to them or read it themselves, have the Holy Ghost teach it to them. And so, I mean, you can read, you can open up God's Word as a Bible-believing Christian and have the Holy Ghost teach it to you. You don't need another person. But it's like God wants to use us as ambassadors for Christ to help them come into the knowledge of the truth. And so then he will use the foolishness of preaching from others for you to see things that you never saw before. You know, I was believing my Bible, I thought, as an 18-year-old, but I didn't see yeah. eternal security, even though it's clear it's there. So then yeah. God takes this guy who is a deacon, um, 
He's not getting any money from the church. He doesn't have a degree. He doesn't have anything. He comes over to my uncle's house, and in the kitchen, there's him, me, my uncle, and my grandmother. And we hear it. And because me and my uncle believe God's word, we learn eternal security from that little message. My grandmother wow. decided not to. But it's, it's clear from Scripture. The mystery yeah. is clear. All this is clear. But a lot yeah. of times we're just... It's like we've got that tunnel vision where we're using the world's wisdom, even though we don't know it. We're using the world's wisdom to try to figure it out. And so right. then it takes the foolishness of preaching. That's why he says God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So he takes something foolish like just some ordinary guy who doesn't have any credentials from the world, and they just open up God's Word and says, here is what it says. And then you say, wow, I've read that a hundred times, but I never saw it before. So it's not that listening to preachers is a bad thing. God can yeah. use that, and he uses that just because it's, it's the foolish things of the world. He says, verse 18, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And so preaching is a foolish thing, and whenever you share sound doctrine, you're really sharing the preaching of the cross. Even if you're not talking about the cross, we've talked about water baptism or spiritual circumcision yeah. or something else. It's all based in the cross because the cross is the chief cornerstone or the foundation of the building. That's where right. it's all based on. And so that's why a lot of times, you know, like you say, you that you had that verse, Acts 4.12, that your church had, but yet I could explain it to you in three minutes. It had nothing to do with me. It's the Holy Ghost, God deciding to use the foolishness of preaching to confound the wisdom of that religion that you were in. Lana, well, you have something? I, I was thinking, Ernie, kind of like, I, I know this, I just thought of the verse of where it says um, where a seed was planted, but then a person comes by and waters the seed um, you know, you, you always had it in you, the verse, you had it memorized, like Eric said, he had it memorized, but it was somebody else that had to water it to get you to see how it should really be. Yeah, yeah first, I have first Corinthians, first Corinthians 3, 5. Yeah, who then is Paul, who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. Yeah, I think line. most all of us have gotten, have learned the gospel and been saved by someone preaching it to us. Even though it's right. in God's word and the words are there and you can get it, most part it's, it's somebody preaching to us. And it's the same thing when it comes to a lot of the sound doctrine as well. Um, when I started going to the the right division church I was in, I learned the basics, but they really didn't go beyond that. And then I got to John Verstegen's church, and I was just blown away because uh, he started two or three weeks after I started coming there. He started to go verse by verse through Romans, and he did this introduction. There were maybe forty people going to the church at the time, and he does this introduction, and he says, "So you know, Romans one, what's that about?" And they'll say, oh, wrath of God. Romans 2, what's that about? Oh, that's the Pharisee who is in religion. Romans 3, what's that, what's that about? Justification by faith. Romans 4, what's that about? David, Abraham. Romans 5, oh, justified by faith in Christ. And they went through each chapter. He asked the question, and somebody from the audience said it. And I was just right. blown away. I thought, wow, these people know God's word. Church I was in, right division church. The people in the audience could not have done that. And it was just like, it's because they've, they've got God's Word, they've got the same material, same right division, but it's just John went a whole lot deeper into, these, into the sound doctrine for today than that church that I was in. I've been in that church seven years. I couldn't tell you what I just said there, but the people in John's church could because he went deeper with it. And it's like I had the Bible and I understood right division and I read it, but it was like you needed somebody to teach it to you because yeah. God uses the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise. So. Feel, feel free to jump in, Tom, at any time. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, yeah, it, I mean, obviously, 
uh, I mean, the name I coined for you, Eric the Edifier, I mean, that's true. I mean, I, I think uh, the church, you know, and the other great verse that we had at the front of the, our little hall was, we preach Christ crucified on a huge arch, which is true, that's Paul. And then right underneath was, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. You know, so there was this mixture, and then uh, then we had, you know, if you ever see any of the signs at the front of a gospel hall, it's Matthew 18 and 20, for where two or three are <laughs> gathered together, my name, there am I in the midst of them. Um, you know, so my dad, my dad lives with us. He's 91 years old, and I've been trying to explain to him right division, and he's like, and you, I mean, our brother and I've talked for a year. You know, like, I mean, he's not angry, but he's just saying, you know, be careful what you're doing. Like, I mean, you know, you're listening to these men. And I said, well, they're opening the Word of God and they're reading from it. And, and it's the King James Bible, you know, yeah. it's not the Darby translation or the revised <laughs> version we used under, which I was brought up with, you know, Darby. Um, so, you know, it, it's just wonderful, the, the exercise that you have and the, um, just freely giving it out, you know, I mean, you know, and I think part of the problem is. You know, I think there's many saved people out there who believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But, you know, yet, like, our two things were baptism and the Lord's Supper, right? That, that That's the two things, right? And head coverings for the women. So, and, you know, people would look at us like, man, you're, you're a weird group, right? You know, and we'd be like, yeah, well, we go by the word of God. Well, except, you know, we got to change a few things, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of the verses, right? We got to go to the Greek for that. Yeah. But yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know. You. Uh, I mean, I'm not trying to flatter you or build you up, or, but I want to encourage you because, man, like, without brethren like yourselves. Like, I don't think I would have ever come to this, you know, mm -hmm. to the understanding level that in the last four years that I've come to. So, anyway, and the, the fact that you invite us to come and, I mean, you sit there and answer questions like from every, you know, if any of our preachers ever said, do you have any questions at the end? Like, I remember in a Bible study, I mean, I went to Bible study every week, right? I took part, and, you know, and I remember a brother asked a question once, and he goes, the, the leading brother, older brother, well respected, he goes, well, that's not in our chapter tonight. Mm. It's like, well, he needs, like, he was a younger brother, maybe you need to know that. Right. You know, maybe something he was facing in life, you know, anyway, I'm sorry, I'm, I guess it's because it's just the, the four of us here are, are just kind of chatting. But, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's so liberating to hear you speak, not change any of the words, not go to the Greek. <laughs> I don't know, like, for Tom, maybe, you know, growing up in the Catholic Church, but me growing up in a supposed, you know, dispensational Acts 2, you know, and hear you speak that way or John Verstegen or you know any of the brethren um, anyway so I have one more question I have a lot of questions but I'll, I'll one more question okay um, should if you were well maybe two questions uh, we were talking <laughs> uh, last week and should fellowship be based solely on doctrine kind of ties into what we're just talking about. Uh, because even though we're like thousands of miles apart, I feel that we have fellowship, but it's based on the Word of God, and it's based also on doctrine. 
Right. And uh, we used to, like, we're, you know, in the gospel halls, you know, it was always taught that, you know, it's a doctrinal fellowship. <laughs> Except, you know, let's not make the King James our final authority. But, you know, so I'm to this, like, I don't know, I just find that these times that we spend together in doctrine, I feel that there's a strong fellowship between us. You know, I mean, yes. I'm talking about all people who rightly divide. Yeah, basically fellowship is, it's really should be based on a heart issue, is what it is. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 6, The, he asked the question there in verse 14, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So, uh, if you've got sound doctrine, if we're all believing, we're Bible believers, we're believing sound doctrine, uh, it doesn't really matter what the level of maturity is. If we all are agreeing that the Bible is our authority, and we believe that doctrine, then we should have fellowship. And if we if we don't have agreement in the doctrine, um, then there won't be the fellowship because there's no concord. Christ doesn't have concord with Belial. You know what agreement at the temple of God with idols? If someone is following a religious system, and I'm a Bible believer, then I don't have fellowship with them. The fellowship is really which, what our authority is. And, um, and so that's why you have the stronger fellowship here. If you have, like, the church I was in, I mean, we had, and it's probably the same for you, Ernie, is that you have a small group of people in that church, and we felt like we have fellowship with each other where we don't have it with anybody else because we are the true believers. We're the ones that understand things. You know, the church out, at the church across the street they don't have speaking in tongues. Well, we have speaking in tongues, so we are we have that fellowship there. That's not really what it's talking about because that that you can apply that to anything. You know, I have a friend who really likes the Los Angeles Dodgers because he grew up in that area. I also like the Los Angeles Dodgers. Um, so we can it has nothing to do with God's word, whether you're a Dodger fan or not. It has nothing to do with that. Uh, but we have fellowship there. You know, that's why you have clubs, different things. You know, you have people who are interested. You know, you have a finance club. You have a, a NASCAR racing club. You have here in Alabama, it's, yeah, people who are into Alabama, you know, Roll Tide, the Crimson Tide. Um, they have fellowship. They're not safe. They may or may not be safe people, but they have a common interest. And that's pretty much what I had in the church I grew up in. Um, now, I think a lot of those people were saved. They believed the clear gospel. But the reason we fellowshiped in our small group and we didn't associate with the group, church across the street or some other denomination or anything was because we all had commonalities that we believed. Right. It was more of a fleshly type fellowship. Now, they okay. used this saying, oh, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols or what concord hath Christ with Belial? And they use that scripture that you did, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So right. we had, the church I was in had a lot of the same arguments that the church you did, had to say that we had fellowship. But there's no way the church that I was in would have fellowship with the church that you were in. Because, well, yeah, right. because we spoke in tongues and you didn't. So you didn't have the Holy no. Ghost, we did. Right. And, so, and, and your church probably would have said, well, you're of the devil because you're speaking in tongues. And that's, you know, so that shows you it's not a fellowship in Christ. Even though we may have had a lot of people in my church who was saved, 
I mean, a lot of people right. in your church who were saved, the fellowship yeah. that we had wasn't over Christ. It was over our fleshly religion that we had. Okay. Um, so, really, the fellowship, when it comes to true fellowship in terms of as members of the body of Christ, that fellowship is over the Bible as our authority and following Christ. And that's what he's talking about when he says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? It's, I'm not going to associate with the, the Pentecostal church that I grew up in because they're not believing God's word. And I am. And it, has, and it doesn't really have to do with maturity. It's where your focus is. So I can have fellowship with... If you've got somebody who is just a Bible... Uh, someone who just believed the gospel and that's all they know, I can have fellowship with that person versus someone who knows a lot of sound doctrine, but they know that sound doctrine based off of their religion. So in other words, someone believes the gospel and they have the Bible as their authority. They don't really know the Bible yet, but that's all they know is they believe the gospel and they don't have the Bible as their authority yet. Uh, I mean, they have the Bible as their authority, but they don't have the sound doctrine in the inner man built upon that. I can have fellowship with that person as opposed to the Baptist person down the road who has a lot of sound doctrine and that they've trusted in Jesus' death as atonement for their sin. They believe in eternal security. Um, they right. recognize a lot of Paul's doctrine. It's in his epistles. Now they go to the red letters, but they still, they still would recognize Paul's epistles as God's word. Uh, so they've got more sound doctrine in their inner man but their, but their doctrine is based upon the, the Baptist religion. So they've, right. And right. so I don't really have fellowship with them as opposed to the fellowship that I have with someone who's just believed the gospel because the one who's believed the gospel has made the Bible their authority, whereas the Baptist guy has made their religion their authority. Right. So right. it really comes right. down to, you know, should fellowship be solely based on doctrine? Really the fellowship is based on a heart issue. Okay. So I can have fellowship. I, I mentioned the, the guy who's the Dodger fan. Well, he's the same guy who I've known for 17 years or so, right. who I finally yeah. shared the gospel with and, and saved. Um, when I was in Calvary Chapel, there was him and there were two other people. They all went to Calvary Chapel, by the way, him and two other guys. Um, the other two guys I have no fellowship with for, what, at least 15 years, maybe? Um, I don't have, I have no idea where, where they're living, what they're doing. I, I don't know what's going on in their lives. But the one guy I maintained the fellowship with, that's because he wasn't grounded in some, right now, well, he does have religious, you know, a lot of false doctrine being Pentecostal, but, but I mean, it, there wasn't the, the strict stand and doctrine with him like it was for the other two. So I was able to keep... It, it, it's, it's a heart issue. And a lot of times, the church, the church I grew up in, uh, I don't have fellowship with any of those people either. I couldn't tell you what's going on with them. Um, and it's, it all has to do with a heart issue. When you're in a very legalistic church, a lot of times you share right division or you share sound doctrine with them and they're just very standoffish. They won't listen yeah. to it. Yeah. But if they're not a real religious person and they have more, more of the heart of the child, like Jesus says, if you do not come to me with the heart of child, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. If they have that, even though they may not have the doctrine, they're at least open to it. So I mentioned the three guys. So the two guys, I have no idea what's going on with them. But the third guy, I kept that relationship with him and I was able to give him the gospel and I believe he's saved right now. Um, and I think I'm going to be doing a future Bible study with him and giving him doctrine. That guy um, went to uh, one of John Verstegen's conferences and listened to it. He had, me and him and Richard had a conversation about healing. And Richard mm -hmm. showed him from Scripture that physical healings is not for today. That guy was a Pentecostal. He rejected that. He didn't believe it. 
But there was no animosity there. He didn't say, mm -hmm. oh, you're a heretic, you're bad, you know, none of that. He just he says, well, I don't believe it, but, you know, he was still had a heart where he was open to listening to it. Right. And right. so because of that heart issue, even though he didn't believe right division, he didn't, uh, you know, believe sound doctrine, at least he had the heart open to it. And so now, 17 years later, I was able to share the gospel with him, and I've gone through a Bible overview with him in Genesis through Malachi. And now I'm going to start getting into the New Testament here pretty soon, and I'll, uh, you know, share right division with him. At least he has the heart there. My point in bringing all that up is, Fellowship doesn't have to be based on doctrine. The, the thing is, it's based, on, it's based on a heart issue. In the church I grew up in, it was based upon the doctrine of that church. And if I went against the doctrine of the church, I'm out of there and there's no fellowship. Right. It's the same thing okay. with the Dodgers. Or it's the same thing with Alabama Crimson Tide. I can have fellowship with somebody over Alabama Crimson Tide, but if there's some strict Auburn fan out there... We're not talking about college football because he's going to get upset with me because I'm an Alabama fan and he's an Auburn fan and there's no compromise. So a lot of times that's how it is with religion, especially in a legalistic church setting. I don't have any fellowship with the people that was in that church I grew up in because they're just, you know, oh, we can't have fellowship because it's based on this doctrine and you reject speaking in tongues for today, so you're out. And you're it's probably right. a lot like that with the church you were in too. But there may be a couple people, like I mentioned, the one guy. And he was willing. He went to John Verstegen's conference. He listened to Richard Jordan teach. He questioned him later about physical healings. Now, he didn't believe it. Surely. Surely. Oh, yeah, surely. Yeah, across the street. Jehovah Witness across the street. Yeah. She was willing to listen to uh, us in... But then her authority in the Jehovah Witness told her she was her that yeah. we were heretics, and so there's no fellowship with her. Yeah, she came over and listened to some mm -hmm. things and thought there was great because we both believe in the Bible, we both believe in God. And then when we share that there is a hell, contrary to what the Jehovah Witnesses teach, and then her the person above her in the Jehovah Witnesses said, you can't have anything to do with them anymore because they believe in a literal hell, and that's a lie of the devil. Well, then that was cut off. Yeah, so, she right, won't yeah. even look in our direction. If we're outside yeah. at the same time, she will not even... She lives across the street from us. She will not, you know, be like, Hey, Shirley, she won't acknowledge us. Really? She won't talk wow. to you. Yeah. She won't look in your direction. So if you don't believe what she believes, Jehovah Witness, they have nothing to do with you. So, yeah. so f fellowship is its a heart issue. I, I like, can have. Yeah, I like the way you put that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, you know, when Paul says, "What concord hath Christ with Belial?" or when he says, "What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness?" It's it's all an issue of where their heart is. So I could have fellowship with the one person out of the three who was willing to at least listen to right of it. He rejected it, but he at least listened to it, and he didn't take the stand like. I'm not your friend anymore, you're a heretic, you're going to hell because you don't believe in speaking in tongues, or you don't believe in physical healings. The guy was at least open. So that, that's the, the issue of fellowship. It's not really... Now the church, in, when you're in a legalistic setting, the, fe, the, the focus is always on the doctrine, which is why they said right. that in that church. So if you don't believe the doctrine like we say it, then you're out. The person across the street, you don't believe... Yeah. The Jehovah Witness doctrine, so you're out. We don't have any fellowship with you. So they base it on doctrine, but God bases it on a heart issue. If my heart... That's why he said, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? The two guys out of those three that I was friends with at Calvary Chapel, they had the idols of religion as a very big thing. And so they think I'm a heretic for believing right division, so I don't have any fellowship with them. The other guy, now he doesn't know all this sound doctrine, but at least he doesn't have that idol of religion at the forefront. So a lot of it has to do with that. You really have to look, you know, the crowd that you were in. Um, they're going to base it on their doctrine. They say it's of God, but it's really their doctrine. And if you reject their doctrine, well, then you're out. But there may be, 
you know, a couple of people in that that in that church that was that would continue to have fellowship with you and would would at least be open to what you had to say. So the, well, the fellowship funny. with doctrine, the agreement between temple of God with idols has to do more of a heart issue than it does with where they are doctrinally speaking. Right. No, I, that, that's really good. And I like what Lana said about the seed. You know, it, that's yes. true. Like, I guess those of us who are searching, you know, the seed to try to understand the scripture, and then when somebody waters that, like yourself, it it comes forth, and we, you know, we're we're happy. <laughs> Not bad. Yeah, I sorry, happy is only on half a cent. We're joyful. Let's there you go. <laughs> I gotta gotta use my words right now. <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it, you're you're absolutely right. To, yeah, because I always I always think okay, doctrine. Like we're all believing doctrine here. Well, no, actually, you're right. We're we're actually just believing the Bible, right. and that's our that's our fellowship. Mm -hmm. That the Word of God is the final authority. So, yeah, a, a better way to put it, you know, mm -hmm. than saying doctrine, right? Yes, yeah, okay. because doctrine so, is doctrine. That's something my church would say, or your church would say. Right. So then I go against yeah. the church's doctrine, and now I don't have the fellowship. But it's really, right. yeah. it's, it's a, if your fellowship is based on the heart issue, then I can still have fellowship with someone who doesn't believe exactly like I do. Right. If we both yeah. have the heart issue of, I'm going to make the Bible my authority, and I'm going to be a Bible believer, right. then, yeah. then there won't be that stand. It's like, you went against church teachings, you're out of here, no fellowship with you. But if their heart yeah. is, and so, you know, that's how you can determine how you're going to go forward with people who were in, hey, their dear brother that you love, that you've yeah, been with for yeah. years. It's, you know, where is their heart? Yeah. You, know, you can continue yeah. fellowship with someone in that church if they're not going to say, if, you know, if they're saying, well, I know we disagree, but I'm still open to what you're saying, you know. But if it's the hard, fast line is, it's this is the truth, and now you've gone against it, and we're not gonna have anything to do with you. Well, then you don't have fellowship with them. So. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, my closest friend <laughs> of like twelve years, and you know we like we used to kind of feed each other, and we study the Bible and have deep conversations and stuff, you know. And when I came into Right Division like four years ago. And I was so excited to tell him, and man, like it's like you think I fell off the planet of, the, of uh, fell off the face of the earth, you know? Like mm. it's sort of like and like now he said, yeah, okay, well we'll we'll agree to disagree, but I can, you know, because he loves the book of Hebrews and you know, and uh, but you know. We text less now. I haven't texted him now in two weeks. You know, we used to text each other like, you know, three, four times a week. And, and I, so you kind of just, you kind of drift apart, you know. And then I'm more like, yeah, I can't wait till Sunday. Can't wait till Tuesday night. You know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you're probably going like, when is this guy going to shut up? But anyway. No, no. I really know. We really appreciate it, and Lana, and uh, you know, I love hearing Tom's questions and everybody else's questions. That it, it's it's great. It's and I I don't know. I look at this as a time of fellowship, even though we you yeah. know we're not in a church building or something. You know, it uh, like you, like where you are. Like you don't you don't go to a church, right? You don't no. you don't fellowship physically with anybody, or you know take the Lord's Supper anywhere or right no nope. so. no there Did was you, a there is a church about 30 minutes away from us that claims to be a right division church and right. we did go there for a few months and um, but they're just they're teaching religion and really in a in a right wow. division context but they're teaching religion and uh, yeah they they allowed me to teach a study there a Wednesday night Bible study which I did for a few months but then Right. You know, it comes to a head where 
you know, you've got to believe God and His Word. And if you're going to, even though you've got a lot of good foundational things there, it's more of a religious thing, not a Bible authority issue. And when they're not willing to make the Bible the authority after a few months, I just had to leave. And I basically... Really? Yeah. And I wow. told them, I mean, I told the pastor, I said, I am I am more than willing to... I, I'm just... Because the pastor doesn't have a lot of teaching. It was mainly... It was his dad's church. And he just right. took it over for, for a few, few years ago. And so he doesn't really... He's not grounded too much in God's Word. And I said, you know, I'm not trying to take over your position. You know, um, I'll be glad to sit down with you and go over... Um, yeah. You know, the Bible, making the Bible your authority and be glad to go over with you and help you out there. You know, if you want to be the, I'm not trying to be the pastor. If you want to be the pastor, that's great. You know, that's what they've appointed you. The board there has appointed you as pastor. Uh, I think that's great. You know, I'll be glad to sit down with you. I, and I said, basically, he wrote me an email that says, well, you know, you're not attending. Why? And I said, I wrote him back. And I says, here's why. And I'll be glad to sit down with you and help you along so you can be a, you know, a better pastor to the church. Um, no response from him. No response since then. Wow. Um, I happened wow. to meet him. It, you know, it was funny that we had, our, we had a conference here. Uh, you know, Jerry and others from Louisiana right. came over for the... This was before COVID, a couple years ago. Right. Um, so we, were, we went to this donut shop that was real close to where the conference was going to be to get some donuts to bring for, because it was early Saturday morning before the people got there from Louisiana, from Pensacola, from all the other areas, we got the, the box of donuts. And uh, we were there eating our breakfast and ordering the donuts. And at the same time, this guy walks in, the pastor of the church. And he sees that I'm dressed with a shirt and tie. So I mentioned to him, you know, oh, we're having a Bible conference over here. I told him where it was. Be glad for you to join us. That's it. I never saw him again. I never heard from him again. He didn't show wow. up. I mean, it's just right across wow. the road there. We're going to have it soon, but he didn't show up. So, yeah. you know, it, there's... So I, you know, I look for opportunities for fellowship. Thought it was great. Right. Here's our, you know, Right Division Church. And when they yeah. don't make the Bible their authority... I give them the opportunity through a letter, a long letter actually, in the email, to, and say, you know, I'll sit down with you one on one, and we'll go over this. And uh, you know, as long as you're, you know, willing to make the Bible your authority, you know, that will help right. you as a pastor because he took it over from his father. He didn't know what he was doing. Um, pretty much what he was doing, it sounded like, was he had some commentary, some NIV commentary that he was reading from the pulpit, for the most part. Wow. And so I said, well, here, you know, you don't have to read from a commentary. I'll show you scripture. I'll be glad to go over it. Yeah. No response. And then I see wow. him. He's there 30 minutes before we're going to go over for the conference, which is literally <laughs> half a mile away from this donut shop. I've got the wow. suit and tie. You know, come and join us. No interest. You know, so. Well, I, we could use that, what's that uh, analogy from... Uh, the Gospels, you know, follow the man that has hath the pitcher of water, you know, uh, and you're kind of like you're kind of like that. You have the Word of God. You're rightly dividing it. You hold it as your final authority, and uh, and you give it you give it out to us. So we appreciate that. Okay, now totally. Let's just switch gears for a second. Okay, uh, unless. Let's Tom, do you have a question or anything, Tom? Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so that was my second question. Should fellowship be based solely on... Oh, yeah, okay, so here's another question I was going to ask you. Totally off topic now. Uh, John, chapter... Uh, John, chapter uh, 20, verse 21... And I'm just trying to understand from a right division standpoint. When it says there, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, 20? did they at that That's moment, verse 22. John 22. 20, 22. Oh, okay. okay. I'm sorry, John 20, 22. And uh, did they receive the Holy Ghost at that point? 
uh, the 11, or did they still have to wait uh, in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to uh, come? I don't think they received the Holy Ghost at that time. He, he says, okay. he breathed on them, saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. But, you know, when you go to Acts chapter 1, just before Jesus ascends to heaven, uh, they're gathered together, and they asked in Acts 1, 6, they asked Jesus, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Right. And then he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the season which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So if he says, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and then it's approximately, so then Jesus ascends to heaven right after that. Uh, Jesus was with them for 40 days. Verse 3 tells you that. Uh, Acts 1, 3 tells you he was with them for 40 days. Right. Right. Pentecost was 50 days after um uh, after the Passover, Jesus was crucified on Passover. So, Jesus was with them 40 days. He leaves, and it's 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2 tells you that they were all in one accord in one place, and then they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, Acts 2, 4. Right. So, right. I think, now Jesus spoke that John 20, 22, receive you the Holy Ghost. He spoke that... Um, Obviously, sometime in those 40 days. But then he says, you, in Acts 1, verse 8, he says, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So I don't think they received the Holy Ghost until the day of Pentecost, which was 50 days after Jesus' death. And he was with them 40 days. So, you know, you do the math. Even if you include the three days there with uh, being in the grave, then right. Pentecost would have been seven days after his ascension. If you take the 40 days, add the three days of the Pentecost, uh, three days in the grave, uh, so that would be 43 days after the Passover that Jesus ascended, and then it was Pentecost, seven days later, that the Holy Ghost came and they received him. So I think Jesus said that in John 20. He breathed on them and said to them, receiving the Holy Ghost. I think he did that to sort of give them an idea of what receiving the Holy Ghost was all about. Because in Acts 2, when the Holy Ghost comes, it says in verse 2, suddenly, Acts 2, 2, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. So I think Jesus breathed, because the Holy Ghost really is a type, the Spirit Spirit, when, right. when God breathed into Adam, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, man became a living soul. God was giving him his spirit. And so spirit has to do with breath in your Bible. Right, okay. And so that's why I think he breathed on them in John 20 to say, you're going to receive a spirit. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And so the way you'll know that you're going to get the Holy Ghost is by the breath. Breath is okay. spirit. So he breathed on them, said, Receive you the Holy Ghost. So then when the Holy Ghost actually came in Acts 2, as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, that told them that that was the Holy Ghost. So okay. I think I think that's why he did that. He didn't they didn't receive the Holy Ghost in Acts 20 20. I'm sorry, John 20 22. Uh, because the Holy Ghost didn't come and fill them until Acts 2. But okay. I think he breathes on them and says, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, so that that way they'll know, probably no more than two weeks after the statement of John 20, 22, is probably when Pentecost came. So when okay. the sound of the mighty rushing wind came in and it filled the house, then they began speaking with tongues. Then they knew, okay, this is the Holy Ghost. Because then when they spoke with tongues... Then Paul or Peter says in Acts 2.17, It shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. So I think the way that Peter had confirmation and the disciples had confirmation that that 
wind that came in and filled, and that was the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, was the fact that Jesus told them in John 20, 22, he breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy Ghost. So that was a way they would know about two weeks later or so when the rushing mighty wind came and they started speaking with tongues, then they would know, okay, this is the Holy Ghost. Because Jesus told me two weeks ago, he breathed on me and says, receive the Holy Ghost. And so here's a rushing mighty wind and it's filled me, and I've spoke with tongues. So now I know that that's just happened now is the receiving of the Holy Ghost because he confirms it in Acts 2.17 when he says, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. He says, this is it. We've received the right. Spirit of God. Well, how do I know that? Well, because the mighty rushing wind came in. Well, how do I know the mighty rushing wind and the tongues that's speaking in tongues is the Holy Ghost? It's because Jesus said in John 20.22, he breathed on them, right. receive the Holy Ghost. So I think it was just, okay. it was basically that statement is there for them to know that when the mighty rushing wind comes in and they start speaking with tongues, for them to know that's the Holy Ghost. Okay. So I think that's oh, why great. he did that. Oh, okay. Yeah, because that was going to be my follow-up question. Why did he breathe on them? So good. Okay. Yeah, that's it was here. just a, wanna... basically a type of, because in Genesis 2... God breathed right. into man's nostrils, man. that gave yeah. man a spirit. So breath is right. associated with spirit. So then Jesus Very says, good. he breathes on them, you're going to receive the Holy Ghost. And so right. they didn't have it at that time because he told them in Acts 1 and Acts 1, 8, ye shall receive power after that the Holy right. Ghost has come upon you. So he just did that so that they would know that when the rushing mighty wind came in, and they started speaking right. with tongues. That way they would know that's the Holy Spirit. Okay. Okay, I think I'll, 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 I'll call it a day. <laughs> All right. And, uh, well, I'll keep these ready for some other time. Yeah, so, thanks, yeah that Eric. sounds good. Yeah, we're almost ready at for... three hours, so uh, very good oh. questions, everybody. I've... We get yeah. Jerry to go. No, but I mean... Yeah. Three hours doesn't even feel like three hours. Probably for you and Lana it does, but <laughs> for us on this end, it's, it's, it's really great uh, great fellowship. It, the only time it feels like three hours is when I stand up after sitting here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but the time itself, when you have fellowship in the Word, it goes by quickly. Okay, Jerry. Hello. Ernie, I, you, you okay now? Good to go. I, I enjoyed that, Ernie and Tom. The whole session, the whole thing was really, really great. Eric, uh, I'm going to tell it a couple of things. Um, I first met Eric in uh, 2014 at the third Slidell Grace Bible Conference. We started in 2012. And I, I don't really remember what brought you to the conference that particular December. You and Lana came over to, to take part of it in the, in the uh, I didn't know you. Yeah, um, we had just moved from Birmingham to, uh, you know, southern Alabama due to work. Yeah. And so um, I had been the pastor of the church in uh, Clanton, Alabama, while I was up in Birmingham. But then I came down here, I was too far away from there, so we really didn't have a church and so I was looking, and I saw from Richard, I think it was Richard's uh, Grace Impact website, where he said there was a conference, he was going to be at a conference in Slidell. And I looked it up, and it was only two hours away for us. So then we just decided, well, we'll just check it out, see who's there. Maybe we can have fellowship with believers. We thought there might be some people from Alabama we would, you know, coming over too. So uh, th that's what brought us over then, we found out. Since I wasn't pastor of that church anymore, and we didn't really have fellowship with anybody, and Slidell was only two hours away, we thought we'd check it out. Maybe we could, you know, have fellowship with fellow believers. So. And I see it's so interesting as I look back on my journey and where I came. I listened to Ernie and Tom and other people. I love listening to people's journeys, where they came from, and, and see how they come to uh, the truth, the right division. And uh, we all have that story. It's, uh, one of the things I did is I, I came over there and introduced myself to y'all and, and, and welcomed you guys. And I uh, 
I think you, you must have mentioned to me about knowing Richard Jordan or something, because he was up front at the table he always sits at, up front. And uh, I went up there and, and said hello to him and mentioned that you were there. And he said this, Ernie. He said, if I would have known Eric was here, I would have got him to, to uh, teach with for us. He says he's very smooth. You're so, a smooth operator. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know that, Lana. <laughs> uh, from there, he began to teach at the conferences each year from 2015, 16, and so on. And um, you can see how, and, and then Tom, Tom, where was you at in 2014? Where you at, where you're at now? I was with Greg Durrell at the time. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, just your life is with, with Greg Durrell, but you lived in this area. Right. And But he didn't, you know, I look back sometime, Ernie, and in 1983, I was at First Baptist Church. Well, First Baptist Church in 1983, Richard was just, at the 1983, Richard Jordan was just starting Great School of the Bible, setting it up. Back in the 70s, he was down in Mobile area, Alabama area. And one of the people that used to be with Richard down in that Mobile area was Art Watkins. Did you know that, Tom? Art Watkins and Richard were together one time. I heard about that, and actually yeah. that's, that's what I was talking about earlier today, about when I brought the question up to Eric. And and that's why he's still so... And that's why he stays so hard on Christ the Vision on his radio show. He hammers yes. us really, really hard. And he doesn't I don't know what you character. named him or not. So that's why I didn't say anything, but that's who I was referring to when I was talking to Eric. Yeah, I, we do him really good. He, he, uh, Frank has been to his church and, and, yeah. and stuff like that. So, But anyway, just all the things that take place. And when we put Richard on the radio in 2018 in October, we could only get a 3.30 in the evening slot. And he was there, and he come on right after uh, Rusty Tardo in the evening. Mm -hmm. And now, and Richie comes on after Rusty Tardo on Forgotten Truths on TV in this, on Sunday mornings. When we put Richie Jordan on the radio down here in uh, 2018, and WSHO makes a note that they've been on the air, I think, for 92 years. I don't know if you ever heard him say that. I heard that. I, I didn't did. know Rick was, but anyway. I don't know if point. Was. Yeah, I have a point. Now, you have men that teach on that radio station for years. I talked to the owner. I talked to the radio manager. And uh, they love the Lord with all their heart and all that. And the different preachers and teachers they have on there. But no one taught right division until we put Brother Jordan on there. Mm -hmm. and I just find that amazing. And it's four hundred and fifty bucks a month. I got we around eleven people. I've got a little bookkeeping deal with Eric. I've got to show you my book. Ever get a chance, I'm gonna show you my book <laughs> my bookkeeping talents one day. You will <laughs> you will just it will be hilarious. You'll get a kick out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so uh, I keep what all I keep the money comes in. I pay the bill each month, and uh, I would ask Eric if you ever had the opportunity to go on the radio, would you would you uh, fit that to your life? As you record it, you know, like Rich has got hundreds of days. You record. Is that something you would you would do? Yeah, I mean, I'd at least consider it. You know, if there's an opportunity, and I have to look at it. And, but I think yeah, that'd be. Look at the format it to do it, you know, to put it together. But I'd love to see you in the Alabama area on the radio uh, with uh, being a smooth operator you are. And I'm, I'm just kidding on you, right? <laughs> but you do have a, Eric has a gift, and I know y'all recognize it, and we all have different gifts. His gift is that Eric, Eric can talk. You notice he don't 
stutter and stammer. Right. Never pick up on that. Okay. He don't. Very, very seldom does he say uh, uh, or any of that. He has a gift that he can just speak whatever. It could be about Dodgers baseball. I bet he could speak the same way. <laughs> yes, he can. <laughs> but that's Eric's talent. In Exodus, you'll see where it's now time to build the tabernacle. And you got all these rough neck rednecks coming out of Egypt. Yeah. And they've been making bricks and stuff for years. But in the group, there were people with the gift. It's called, you ever hear somebody say, boy, that person, that's a gift of God you got there. And it is. And they, God reached into that group of rednecks, I'll call them, I'll pick on them, and began to make that tabernacle, a beautiful piece of construction, hammering gold and sword and carpet. And so I'm saying this to encourage uh, Ernie and Tom mm -hmm. that somewhere down the road, and Ernie, I know I've mentioned this several times, and you have to work that out with what you're going through with your health issues, And but I know you have the heart for it, and I, I see Tom's growth spurt. Uh, and uh, you come to a place where you just step out and turn the living room in your house into a Bible study thing. And you y'all work that out however you do it. Be with your family or however you do it. But pick out a day, a night that works for you. And, and that day, that night, at that time, you make yourself available to teach a topic, a doctrine, and so on. And we have a wealth of men who have who are ahead of us and that that's what I've done over the years. I study and I would put something together. So in saying that, one of the things I hear the teachers say over the years is a little would it be a cliche a, a, I don't know the correct term for it. It would be Colossians two thirteen, you could turn that real quick. And they would I know Eric has heard it, and um, if you listen to him enough, you'll hear one of them say it. In Colossians 2.13, And you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, he had quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. But notice it says, in you being dead in your sins, and then comes the word and. And what they'll say is, they'll call, they'll say the twice dead Gentiles. Y'all heard of that? Twice dead Gentiles. And so I brought that up at the Bible study, and I, I said, let me see if I can figure out what they're doing. And I began to look at it, and it took me back to Genesis chapter 11, where God turned the Gentiles over to their horse desire to worship Baal, to go after Satan, Baal worship. That they were cut off from God, done. And then he put up the wall of petition. Now they're in double trouble. And I was going to ask Eric, because when I brought it up at the Bible study, as you will, it will happen at a Bible study. You're going to have people saying, well, that don't make sense. I don't, you can't be twice dead, and so on and so forth. But why did Paul write, write that there in your uh, understanding, Eric, with that? Yeah, I... <laughs> you know, it could be that... and. I haven't really thought about it too much, but I would say that, you know, if I was trying to come up with an answer now, I would think that being dead in your sins has to do with you just following your sin nature. And the uncircumcision of your flesh, I would think that has to do with your inability to get out of your situation of being dead in your sins. So it's like you, in the first, you, and like you say, twice dead, it's a good statement. It probably does that to say you're dead because of all the sins you've done, and you're dead because you don't have any power to get out of that situation yourself. 
You know, it's sort of like if, let's say, I go into debt, you know, and I have to get, you know, declare. It's like I go, I put on this massive amount of debt on me, and so that's one thing is I'm, I don't have financial solvency. I don't have financial, you know, I don't have any money behind me because I've got all this debt. But then maybe, you know, if I have a job and I get a really good job, I could sort of, I could get out of that debt. I've paid, I've got this huge debt, but now I get a, a big promotion or a big job. And so now I can make the payments and get out of it. I think he says it twice dead like this to show not only have you got all this debt that you owe, the wages of sin is death, so the debt that I owe is death um, for my sins, but I also don't have any ability to get out of that situation. And I think that's what the second part is, the uncircumcision of your flesh. Like he says in Romans 7, for the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So, I would think that's why he says that. It's like you're dead in your sins. You've got this massive debt that you owe, which is death. But not only do you have this massive debt, but you have no ability to pay it because your flesh is uncircumcised. There is no, um, no power within your flesh to pay that debt. So, so I would think that's why he says that that way. Yeah, you you hear him say it, Ernie. But now that we mentioned it, and uh, it's just a a term they use to kind of catch your attention about the trouble the Gentiles are in. Yeah. What was you gonna say, Ernie? Well, I was just I was gonna say uh, uh, Ephesians two twelve. You could almost say we're five times dead. <laughs> you know, because he lists those five things in verse twelve that were five characteristics of of the Gentiles, you know. But anyway, yeah, okay, I'll be aware of that. I'll, I'll keep my ear up for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. yeah and, and you could also say in that Colossians 2.13 that you're twice alive, if you want to think about it, because he says, dead in your sins, so that's the first thing, uncircumcision of your flesh, that's your second death. Well, then he hath quickened you together, so that makes you alive yeah. once, and then having forgiven you all trespasses, so that makes you alive the second time. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. And, and you'll hear these kind of things that are new to us. This was a while back I heard this. So, uh, let's see. Frank, who I met in 2013, Frank was with me, uh, I think Friday night he came over and we watched the opening teaching, thank you Richard, on the conference Friday night, and he uh, has an ongoing question about human beings in the scriptures that God calls them as in... Uh, you're, you're familiar with this. Genesis 6, 9. And Frank's like a pit bull. When he locks onto something, you don't let it go. <laughs> he, he does a good job with his Q&As. Uh, and it talks about that in that uh, verse... If I'll turn to it. These are the, oh, by the way, uh, Eric, all your answers were really done well today. The one on Matthew 24, 34, which is an ongoing in-house Thing that happens around a little circle with someone, and uh, but and I've been hearing some things on it from other grace teachers as I'm looking at it, and the you brought up about the misuse of the word generation from churchianity, where you expounded on what I've been hearing from other grace teachers in a, in a way that's very helpful that. Uh, 
it's a spiritual, not just physical uh, generation, but a spiritual generation, which one of the teachers showed me in his, when I say showed me early, when he said it, I understood that what he's saying in my heart was correct in the Bible, that it's a spiritual thing. He didn't use that term, but he did take me back to Cain. It started with Cain in, in unbelief in the, the uh, spiritual thing. And that generation still exists at that time in Matthew 24, 34. It exists today, that generation, and it will exist in the Jacob's trouble. And they will see, and that's what he says, the, they say about, it has to be those people because they're going to see Christ's return. Well, they are. That generation in the 70th week we'll see, but it's the same generation that started with Cain. It was there when Jesus Christ showed up and all the way through, spiritual. And uh, Eric did a real, real good job of that. That's why Gail asked it, because I watched Gail get uh, nailed at a, we was having lunch one day, <laughs> and it was brought up, and that person was there. And I went there for lunch. I wasn't going to get into it. I had this thing where there's a time and a place, and we were just having lunch, and I didn't want to get into a spiritual ping pong battle. Yeah. At that time, we were just having a good lunch together. But, but again, I know you helped Gail, Connie, and myself out today, Eric. Appreciate that on that on that issue. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm playing Frank right now, because I'll let him know I did this. <laughs> but these are the generations, and there they are still there, um, the generation thing. The believing generation, Noah was involved, correct, Eric? He was part of the spiritual generation. He was a believer. Right. And then you had all the other people around him that was the generation of unbelievers. Yeah. The the one that was going to all drown. Noah was a just man and perfect. And that's where Frank sees that, and he struggles with <clears throat> the Word of God calling people just and perfect. And you'll see it with uh, Simeon, and you'll see it with uh, in Luke there, where uh, people are called just and perfect and holy. And in Romans, Romans, uh, Three nine all all under sin verse ten none righteous no not one. So the person with that problem and uh, with the and I explained to him as best I could at, at that night. And uh, how would you uh, help Frank out with that? Well, I would say like he said, you know, in Romans three. There, in verse 9, they're all under sin. In verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 11, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. So when God calls somebody just, and he does that with, uh, with Job as well, you know, in Job 1 yes. and 2. Saying, people, yes. Yeah. Um, when he calls him a just man and perfect in his generations, then... Him being just cannot be dependent upon his own works. Because Romans 3 says, There is none there is none righteous, no, not one. So then, him being just must be the same way we are made just. In Romans 3, uh, you know, verse 34 says, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And verse 28, he says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Um, so I would say that the way that Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, he's just in that God justified him. He didn't do it by his own works, because in your own works none is righteous. So God must have justified him 
based upon him believing God. And over in Hebrews chapter 11, we're told about Noah. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. Hebrews 11, verse 7 says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So that verse there tells you that Noah had faith in God. He did not... He, so in other words, he wasn't a just man based upon his works. So he received just like us. We, he was justified freely by God's grace. And so Noah had faith in what God told him. God told him to build an ark. He did that. So I think what it says, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. It shows that Noah believed God. He was justified by faith, just like any of us. So he would have, in, in that context, he would have believed that he was a sinner and he trusted in God to save him. Um, he didn't have the Mosaic law, but he must have known about bringing sacrifices for sin because that's what God set up when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. He set up the, the place there, the mercy seat, with the two cherubs that guarded the garden. And that's what Abel and Cain were doing as they were bringing sacrifice to that mercy seat. Abel brought the sacrifice God required. Cain did not. So Cain was judged and Abel's sacrifice was accepted by God. So Noah must have done that as well. He must have bring sacrifices. We know from after he got out of the ark in Genesis chapter 9, I think it is. Is that where he gets out? Um, 9, 6. Where he was called back. Well, I'm looking for the place. Oh, chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 20 is where it says, Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So Noah, uh, no, I bring that up to say that Noah was familiar with need, needing to have to bring animal sacrifices as a covering for his sin. Because that's the first thing he does when he gets out of the, out of the ark. So he must have done that before. So I would say that's how Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Um, just man being justified by faith and he had faith in what God told him which was that he was a sinner and that he bring the animal sacrifices as a covering for his sins and then when God told him to build the ark he did that by faith we're told that in Hebrews 11 so he had faith uh, in God to save him and he uh, operated in faith by those animal sacrifices and then also by uh, building that ark so uh, that made him a just man, perfect in his generations. Perfect just means, doesn't mean he was sinless. It just means he's complete. And he would have been complete in Christ, just like us. Now, he didn't understand that, uh, but he would have been um, justified through the shed blood of Jesus Christ by him recognizing his sin and bringing those sacrifices. And that made him a just man and perfect, being complete in Christ uh, because of his faith in God to give him his righteousness. And then when it says Noah walked with God, I think that's shown in him building the ark. So he had faith, but then he had works based upon that faith, which is the work of building the ark, because God told him to do that. And so you can make that argument with Job or you know other people where God declares him to be a just man. He, they're justified freely by God's grace, by God giving them his imputed righteousness. So it wasn't, it wasn't anything with his own works. He wasn't a perfect man in terms of sinless. It was just that he was, uh, he trusted in God, did what God told him to do, which was to bring the sacrifices, and that's how he was made a just man. And then he walked in his justification when he built the ark that God told him to build. And so that's how Noah walked with God. Very good. That's uh. I, and I hit, I hit on some of that uh, in a little bit of time, and uh, not as clear as you just did. And that now I got that. That'll be uh, someplace that Frank can come pick this up if he gets on a uh, 
you know, he could come sit down and listen to this, and uh, I'm sure it'll help him out even more. Frank has come a long ways since I met him in 2013 at our 2013 conference. Frank heard about it and uh, and showed up, and he's been on a, uh, a journey and a learning curve. He's done a real, real good job. It's just so much we have to unlearn to have our mind renewed how early in time. Yeah. All, all of us go through it, uh, but it's a great it's a great journey, and we, we appreciate God. Just like Eric mentioned about, and Noah found grace in the eyes of God, and uh, mm-hmm. God knew his heart. He knows Tom's heart, all you know, your heart, Ernie, and uh, so just just continue. And that that's about it. Uh, um, I talked to you about the radio, um, and I brought that up because I wanted, I was hoping more people would be here. I would love to have you. We eventually, from 3.30, Eric, in the evening, that we had the, the spot we could get, I told the, the manager and uh, owner of the station I'd like to get, I'd like to get um, an early spot because I wanted to fit Richard in between Right after James Dobson, he's the first guy at the gate kind of, and then they had a, a smoking for Jesus program came on after that. I don't know what they smoked, but that was, that was, the, day that was the day of the program. I'm picking on the bastard. The, the flood took him out of here to Texas in Katrina, and he kept his radio show here from Katrina, reaching to his people. And I'm just picking on the past, you know, I don't know it's hard, but I just, but that was the name of his program, Smoking for Jesus. And I said, <laughs> and the owner of the station told me, <laughs> if he's thinking about moving out for that spot, he said, if he does, I want it because, Tom, you got it. After James Dobson, Smoking for Jesus, you had, um, Nick Calabodi, which is a very long-running Bible teacher who uh, I knew, I had book there, who taught grace as best he could. He was a grace teacher, but he only went so far. Nick Calabodi passed away a few years ago, but they still fund his radio program. Well, Nick helped me. I remember I called Nick up. And I was going to start running to Baton Rouge where he taught in person because I, he was teaching me from where I was at. And uh, But another person came into my life and I didn't need to go to Baton Rouge. So you got James Dobson, Smoking with Jesus, Nick Calabodi, and then Greg Durrell at 8.30. And after Greg Durrell at 8.45, you got Art Watkins. Watkins. Mm-hmm who comes on and just bashes his right division with a mall. I'm talking about with a mall, man. He's just, he's just, and, and Frank was going to him and listening to him and going to his church. And Frank would, I mean, Frank bold. He'll go right, you know, right to your place and drive the Alabama to his church and, and say, well, this is what I've been hearing. And they go back and forth, you know. So, lo and behold, smoking but Jesus pulled the show off and, we got that spot mm-hmm. right in between Nick Calabodi, a, a man who fought, wanted to teach, and Greg Durrell, who Hoss desire is to teach the grace of God. That's what he wants to do. And then Nick Calabodi, I mean, uh, Boy, Mark, yeah, who just takes a, a sledgehammer to the right division. <laughs> so I'm, I'm saying all that. It'd be great to have you in the Alabama radio. If you just check it, check into it. Because let me tell you this. When I first mentioned, I said, you guys, I said, I'm working on putting Richie Jordan on the record. I could listen to his um, daily Bible time. It's a 15-minute program. It works real good. So I asked him, which one would you suggest, Richie? Well, Debbie Keeble, really. I talked. I did all my dealings with Debbie. And uh, she said, he likes the 15-minute program. He does have a half-hour program, The Riches of Grace. Daily Bible time, 15 minutes. 
gets a lot said in 15 minutes. Like this past month, he's done uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and showing Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the way God, the Holy Spirit, introduced him in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and why you have the four Gospels, so he does that boom, 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 boom. And he, he may have done these things 15, 20 years ago, I don't know. But there he is. And there, there's not just him, there's the right at the vision, right there in the midst of all those guys that want to be grace teachers. It's amazing, you know. And here we are. And so far, we've got 11 people that give different amounts. We've got one couple that gives 100 bucks a month, another one, Steve, gives 60. And uh, most of us give 35, some give 30, 33. And I keep the books that I got to show you one day. It's really neat. And uh, and we, we and that's what we do. We've got some response from it. We some fruit has come from it. Mm-hmm. They announce the conferences every year, so it's a real great outreach. Well, some of the people when I began said, "Well, I don't listen to that station anymore because I was going to ask for funds." Well, I don't, I don't listen to that station any longer. I said, but I, I know you did, because I did too. Back in the 80s, I listened to WSHO, and WSHO's helped me understand some things I didn't know about, coming out of JWs. And I listened to that radio station all the time, and it had men on there that helped me. So, I'm saying that to just kind of, if you don't have a target, you, you know, something to shoot at, you don't have a target, you know, that one day we'd have you on the Alabama station over there, put you right next to Nick Odd Watkins, too. Understand he's on a bunch of them. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, just, just thinking out loud. Yeah, that sounds good. I know Frank has called me before, and he says, you need to call up Art Watkins and debate him on his show. That would be great. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that sounds like Frank. Uh-huh, but Art didn't want to do that. Yeah. He said so, no to it. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, that yeah. would have been a great, if, if Art was at a place where he wanted to do that, you know, that would have been really, really good because he'd have done a great job. But he comes, he was in it one time, best understand, right there with Richard and him, and he left it, you know. Mm-hmm. So that happens on the way. And, uh, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. yeah, that sounds good. I'd love to do that. All right. Guys, Does anybody have one last one? I think my husband's turning blue. We might need to let him go pee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. Well, I, I guess we'll want, see. We'll see. I just want to thank Jerry for the encouragement. Thank you. Uh, we're working on my sister-in-law right now, and uh, she is really she was brought up same as my wife and I uh, in the brethren in the gospel halls and she is really interested in right division we've been teaching her some stuff so um, you know it can start from like you say just just working with people individually I had a lady tell me years ago <clears throat> up at Lenny and Lisa's house there in Dalton Northern Arkansas down she looked at me one day and I was teaching up there well, that's not good and she said, Jerry, you know, you don't need to come up here anymore. It's 50 miles. Uh, we got it. And, well, that, and I said, that's all right. I'm going to still come back. I don't mind coming back. And that was a long time ago. And we didn't have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've learned the more that I learn, the more I realize what I didn't know before. You know, yeah. the more that I have to grow. So. All right, thanks everybody. Yeah. We'll say good night.